Welcome to the Delight Your Marriage podcast. You're joining me, Bevla Rose, as I dive deep into the beauty, power, and truths about intimacy. Learn not only the practicals, but the heart behind what making love is all about. Delight your marriage. Hi there, welcome. This is Bella, and I wish I could reach through the screen and give you a high five or a hug or a handshake. And actually, my son, when he was like four, every single night, he's like, can I have a hug and a kiss and a high five? (laughs) That was what was required of us every night. (laughs) Pretty awesome. Um. (laughs) What I'd like to talk about is why marriage matters in terms of the end times. So if you're like me, passages like Matthew 24 and other places in the Gospels where Jesus talks about the end times and then Revelations and these other aspects of the Bible, you know, Paul talks about it too. I mean, it's, it's serious. It's going to be very bad in the end times. And we don't know, you know, there's different uh, theories of whether or not we get taken first or after the tribulation or whatever. Um, That's why I always encourage you to go to your pastors and find out, (laughs) get the word of God training and teaching from them, because that is not my role in your life. But um, my role is to inspire you in this little aspect of life, which is the home environment. So that's what I want to give you some insight into why marriage matters to that time. Because we don't know if it's going to be our generation, your kids' generation, their kids' generation, their kids' kids' generation. We don't know. Some people think it's pretty soon. I'm, I'm not one of those people who just know enough. I, I, again, please find out, learn more about what you believe. Don't, don't just leave it to others. Um, have your, stand up and and take your place. I invite you, um, in this, in, in what we've got going on here. It's, it is a war and that's, that's actually what I want to talk about. I've got kind of a funny story to start off the conversation with. So I'll try to make this entertaining, but it's important stuff we, we discuss. So before we get started, if you are, are ready to take your place on the wall, but you see that marriage is a big hindrance for that, uh, which is one of the biggest distractions the enemy likes to give is, you know, sexlessness in marriage requires so much pain and suffering and distraction from what God ultimately wants to happen in your marriage. So or, or just loneliness or emotional uh, disconnection or walking on eggshells. All these things are very difficult. Uh, and we would love to help you get that squared away so you can go on to do God's will in more fervor and excitement and energy and fueled. You know, marriage is just the vehicle. It's not the destination. We never want that to be the destination. It's the vehicle. And you got to change the oil and get it gassed up. And you got to get the things, the tires changed and, and understand the general stuff to keep your, your, uh, your vehicle working well. So in any case, I just invite you to uh, listen in. But if you're ready to take the next step and see how we can help you, hopefully you've been listening to these transformation stories. They're just amazing. To God be all the glory. But uh, you can take your next step for a clear free clarity call at delightyourmarriage.com slash cc. We've got an incredible team to support you in this entire journey. First step is talking to Dana. She's absolutely wonderful. You will love her. Delightyourmarriage.com slash cc. All righty, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I recorded such a beautiful episode. And uh, apparently I forgot to actually hit the big red button called record. So um, it was said, and you can just trust that it was good. All right, let's wrap this. uh, (laughs) It was a practice run. It was a really good practice run. I want to start this episode with a story that's kind of funny. 
Uh, so bear with me. It is relevant, I promise, but it will, it is hilarious. So first of all, the other day I was just excited to spend time with Jesus. I've got, I had my Bible and my journal and my book, and I was on my way to a very special spot in a park that was a little bit far away. And I walked there and I was going to go. It's got this gorgeous, gorgeous view at the top of this, this area and view of the, par- the, the park and the water. It's just gorgeous and uh, kind of a secluded area. So excited. So as I'm walking there, every now and then I would see this little bug and it's a lanternfly bug before it turns into a lanternfly moth. It looks more like a moth. It's actually very pretty. So they're red with white spots and then it grows into something that's uh, larger, more like a moth and it's got, it's like gray wings and red wings underneath. Very pretty. But sadly, they are invasive species, and they're actually spreading all around the northeast, and they're killing trees, and they're threatening some <clears throat> some big industries um, because they're they're eating the trees that make the make the product. So the produce. So um, our job, if if you have insight, <laughs> you know that you're supposed to squish these things because uh, each one of them you know, we'll then have babies and then more of them. And da, 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 da. So it really is becoming a major issue. And, uh, and so we're as a there, that's what they tell us to do as New Yorkers, we gotta, we gotta squish these bugs. Okay, cool. So we did that last year, last summer. So now they're just, they're just, you know, hatchlings or whatever. And they are pretty soon will turn into actual moths and they'll make even worse, um, effect on the trees. And so we're trying to squish them now. So on my way to this park, I'm every now and then squishing this fly. And it's pretty funny because they jump. So you, uh, you know, you try to squish it. And if you don't get it the first time, then you, you jump around trying to squish these things. So it looks very funny. So people definitely were watching me as I here and there, I'm squishing them. Um, but as I got closer to where I was heading, I started to be squishing more or at least saw more or try to attempt to squish more and every now and then I would stop and or, or, or somebody would um, go past me and I would be like you know about squishing the lanternflies right because they kill the trees and there would be some people who knew and they're like yeah absolutely good for you and um, and some people who didn't know and uh, and they would stop and listen and I would mention it to them or there were some people that thought I was the crazy lady jumping on bugs because I yeah that's what was happening so uh anyway we got I got to the area that I had been aiming to get to and I could not believe how many lantern flies were there I mean just so many it was wild um so I did what I could to just squish them and just go for it and Oh, on the bench and on the little wall and on the pathway, I'm squishing, squishing, squish. I probably squished between 300 and 400 just just by being there. Seriously, I didn't count. And you might be thinking, oh, that's certainly an exaggeration, Bella. But I, uh, I'll I'll let you be the judge of that in a minute. So I was there for a while, and I was finally like, you know what? I'm just trying to spend time with Jesus. Let me see if I can ignore them for a little bit and and sit here and. Um, and, uh, and pray. And it was so hard to sit next to these things that kill trees and they're climbing up the bench next to me. And then they started crawling on me. (laughs) So I couldn't ignore it. Nope. Can't ignore it. Okay. I'm up. (laughs) Did a couple more squishes and then left. And went to my park and was able to spend some time with Jesus there. And and I I always am careful if I feel like God um, is speaking to me on something. But this is how I was interpreting what was going on. There's a war going on, right? There's these these lantern flies, and um, they they're gonna attack the trees. And this is God's creation, and this is beautiful trees, wonderful. We can't have these lanternflies kill them all. Um, 
we as humans need what they produce, air, <laughs> lots of other things. We need trees. Um, and there were a lot of people who either didn't know, uh, and and really, if I didn't know that this was happening, I wouldn't really be stressed. I wouldn't be worried about it. I wouldn't uh, have very much to do also because I, I wouldn't be concerned. But the truth of the matter is I knew there was a war going on. I knew something big was happening and I knew I had a role to stop it. And so maybe it seemed like of all these millions and millions of bugs, I'm only squishing 300. But just by doing that, I spread the word to some others and they'll now be squishing bugs, right? And that we're spreading the word, we're doing what we can and we're helping others to do it. So I ultimately recruited my sons. We went back there, same day, same area, and we squished 2,000. 250 in about an hour. That was it in that one little area. And they kept coming. It's not like we got them all. They were, they were just basically crossing a little part of the pathway and we were just intercepting their, their cross. And the point of the matter is there's a war happening for our families. There's a war happening um, if you've read Matthew 24 or some other areas of the Bible, uh, um, revelations and some er other areas of the gospels, first of all, ask your pastor about what they mean, <laughs> because that is not my role. I do not know, um, all the details around it, but do pursue your pastor. Uh, do go to a local church. I highly recommend that. That that's, Christian podcasts, biblical podcasts are, are seeking to do the Bible, but you need to be in a community face to face with other believers. Uh, really, you really do. And I, I just invite you to, to put that on the top of your priority list to go find a church, get courageous, take courage, you need to be learning these things um, in person, get with those folks. Um, but anyway, around this, uh, these, these passages, they talk about the end times. And it's scary stuff. It's talking about the tribulation. It's talking about suffering and the pain and the difficulty. And the truth of the matter is we will all suffer. I don't know if it's the tribulation or other things that you are suffering or will suffer in your life, but you will suffer. And what does that do? We know from James, it says that we should count it all joy. We should count it all joy that we suffer because it creates in us perseverance. And so we don't know if we're going to be around for the really bad tribulation, right? Some people think that we'll be taken up before it gets really bad as, as believers will be taken up. And some people believe we're going to endure it. And Either way, if we, if we think that we're going to be taken up, we may not do the work, the inner work to make sure that we have a fortitude to endure it. Um, so to some degree, it's probably better for us to assume that we're not going to be taken up. And if we are, what a great surprise. <laughs> but if we, if we have to endure the horrific things that Jesus talks about, uh, yeah, we need to have an inner fortitude. And so if it's not us that have to endure it, it'll be our kids. And if it's not our kids, it's our kids' kids. And if you don't have kids, then it's your neighbor's kids. Like we need to be really aware of what, how we're sowing into the generation that deals with the tribulation. Because that's what we're dealing with. Our children need more than just a good education so they will make enough money to be successful and, and possibly get married one day. That's not really what it is as believers. Like, that's a nice thing. That's a fine thing to hope for and want. And I mean, I want that for my kids. But that's not really what our goals are. 
our goals are is that they will endure till the end. So what does marriage have to do with the end times? Well, marriage actually is really, if we have kids, it's about evangelism. So ideally, the work that I do here and the work we do at Delight Your Marriage influences you. That's, that's the goal. But you will never be influenced to the degree that my kids will be influenced by me. By any means. I, I get you for a couple hours here and there, even if you're in a program. <laughs> but my kids, they see it all. They know it all. They, they get what I really think about this relationship with Jesus. They get how skin deep it is or how deep it is. And if I'm modeling the kind of character that they will need, to suffer the tribulation? I mean, my gosh, I sure hope my example for them gives them that to then suffer. So ultimately, in the end times, I don't think marriage is, well, if you have a great marriage, when there's big tribulations and sufferings, we've all been there, right? Either your bad marriage makes the suffering worse or your good marriage makes the suffering more, um, you've got a, a partner in it. You've got, a, you've got um, a comrade, you've got a friend, and it does really help with suffering. But right now, we need to be awake and we need to be vigilant. We need to do what we need to do to prepare for the suffering. So let's play out what divorce looks like in terms of the end times. So what divorce looks like is that you've got two families uh, instead of one. So that means you've got a mom who, who goes into a different space and then a, a dad that goes into a different space. So now you've got two spaces that need to be paid for, which means each partner has to now work full time, whereas one might have been able to stay home with the kids and help uh, develop the children's character. But now the children are not only unable to stay in the same home, they have to shuffle back and forth between these different houses, which is very unstable for children and, uh, and their, their life, in fact, because then depending on where things are, are located, you've got a group of friends in one area of, of town, and then you've got a group of friends in another area of town or neighbors or what have you. And, you know, it, kids miss out on activities and things like that. When I, I just remember inviting different kids to different functions and they can't come because they're with their dad that weekend or with their mom that weekend or, or what have you. And um, so that, and since the parents are full time now, there's less time with the kids. So where are the kids? The kids are in after school activities or they're at school where they might've been able to be homeschooled before. Or they're um, they're uh, with a nanny or a babysitter or, or what have you. Uh, and no one, absolutely no one is as invested as your, in your children's character and walk with God as you are. No one cares about their walk with God like you do. No one cares about them becoming a true, deep disciple of Jesus like you do. No one is there to correct their, uh, their, their poor behavior that stems from their heart. No one has the congruency of, of seeing their full-on life to talk about what was going beyond like what was happening on the inside of them when they got so jealous of their brother that they hit him you know what is going on in the inside what's happening at the heart level what do their prayers sound like are they are they uh, have a grateful heart do they have a grateful heart? like what is on the inside where what is what are they letting their mind think on like who is processing those things with them or even if you don't want to go that deep, who's making sure they're outside experiencing nature and life and, and enjoying the, the, like running around and jumping and all this stuff, playing and creativity, all the stuff 
no one's going to be invested as in that as much as you will as a parent. And we don't know what will happen in your kids' lives, what they'll have to endure, what suffering they'll have to endure. But if you're not there focused on them, you're distracted by the pain of your marriage or you're distracted by what a divorce it means because divorce, again, full-time, but then also now that parent who got divorced, is they're now thinking about finding their next partner. So they're, they're going on dates and they're hanging out with friends and they're trying to find that next person. And their, their whole life pursuit is not around family and child rearing and their, their focus is not there. And, and even a very focused parent, parenting is hard. It it just really is. If you, if you care, um, and so I kind of go back to this analogy with these lantern flies. Um, we are at war. We are at war. The enemy doesn't want great families, great marriages to thrive because that is the best possible place to equip the next generation. God created family. Jesus himself was raised in a family. I want my kids to have the fortitude of Jesus. My goodness. (laughs) How do we raise our children? We want to raise them well in a family. John the Baptist was raised in a family. All right? All all of them. They were all raised in families. Uh, So we need... We need God's help to do this well. We need God's help to do this well. We need to do it in God's way uh, because we're at war. And so for even those, I'm going to go back to this funny story, but those that were walking by on the path, um, they don't know what's going on. Uh, They also don't care. They don't have the insight to see that we're at war. They're just focused on their own thing. And we need to be really cautious that we are not so focused on our own thing that we're missing what God wants us to be about. Jesus wasn't afraid to suffer. See, that's the thing. Jesus didn't just suffer and die on the cross. He, he made choices to suffer. He didn't just follow comfort. Oh, this must be God's favor because this is a good thing. This is all positive. And that's not how Jesus was led. He wasn't led by good. That that wasn't his discernment. His discernment was the Lord, was the Father's will. He spent so much time with the Father. And even just saying that, it convicts me. I need to spend more time with the Father because we never want to get in a rut and say, oh, I'm going this direction. I've always gone this direction. Let me keep going this direction, this direction, this direction. No, we want to be redirected and redefined by the Lord over and over again. We are sheep. He's a shepherd. That's why we need a shepherd. He's going to guide us in real time. He is the leader. He does that. And so... As I was reflecting on this experience, it really showed me that I I have a role to play in this war. My role is not to be a pastor. That's not. I'm a female. No, I do this biblically. My, My role is of the home and to empower and equip and exhort men and women to be that role in the home as it's reflected in the Bible. for men to lead, for men to be the spiritual head of their home, whether they feel qualified or not, whether they feel like they know enough about the Bible or not, whether they feel confident in the way they pray out loud or not, it is on him to find the appropriate spaces for their kids to grow spiritually. It is on him to start those spiritual conversations and make sure everyone is attentive at the dinner table when they start talking about it. It's on him to hold the line and make sure the family focuses on things of the Lord. 
And it is on wives to submit and to say, you know what, I would prefer to control because I am very scared things are not going to go the way I want them to go. But I'm going to let it go this time. I'm going to let it go. Because there's an insight that my husband has that I don't have. We only have to trust that God did it this way on purpose. We'll find out when we get to heaven, the reasons. And you know what? There are blind spots we all have, and we only uh, can see either on retrospect or we may never see our blind spots, maybe until heaven. And we're like, oh, thank God I trusted my husband when da, 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 da. I happen to be graced to see that all the time where I'm like, oh my gosh, I almost did a ridiculous thing. Thank the Lord I trusted my husband. Um when I do this right. But that's my, that is definitely my temptation is to not trust him. Um, It's really trusting the Lord by trusting my husband. Um, He has an insight. He's, he's the protector. But if I try to step in there and save the day, then there's no space for him to. If I don't want our family on my shoulders, I have to stop putting it on my shoulders and critiquing him for not stepping up and putting it on his shoulders. Like, he's like, what do you mean? It's already on your shoulders. Like, so we, we as women can't be in our, our male's role. We've got to do this biblically. And you and I both know the world is very confused on the roles of men and women. And, and the, and it's all logically nonsensical. It doesn't make sense in terms of logic. Like how, there's so much more I could say about that, but there's a lot of really good thinkers that are, they're getting to the bottom of this transgender um, travesty. It's so sad. It's just so sad. But, um, but what, what can we do is not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by, with good. So we can, we can teach and train and encourage and exhort people, we as in all of us, um, on, on what it does mean to be a man, what it does mean to be a, a woman. And, and how do you do that with, um, with graciousness and giftedness and in love and with wisdom and insight and all of that? They need to be taught. We all need to be taught. According to Titus 2, people have to be taught these things. And so I just invite you to um, remember we're at war. We're at war. And we're either equipping the next generation, evangelizing our own kids, or we are not. And so when we live outside of the way God set up marriage in our home, our kids take notice. Was mom the controlling one? Was she telling everyone what to do? Or was dad actually the leader of the home? Did she step aside and let him make those hard choices? And did she honor him in the midst, in her heart? Because the kids can tell. You know, I hope that my voice and my, whatever I say, hopefully influences you towards Jesus. That's the goal. That's the heart. But ultimately, I influence my kids far more than I will influence anyone else in the whole world. And so that's my biggest evangelism ground is my own kids. So I don't know how old your own kids are, but you still, no matter how old they are, you still have a huge influence in their life. But it's an inside job. It starts with you having your own heart right before the Lord, being close to Jesus, getting wisdom, loving the word of God. That's where it's got to start is falling in love with the word of God which only happens by actually spending time in it. Getting through the dry, oh, this is not cool. You got to get through that. Got to get through that. Um, And a lot of people don't know where to start with the Bible. Just grab a Bible, a physical Bible, and start in Matthew. Discover who Jesus is. You might not get out of Matthew for a couple months, and you will fall in love with the Bible because there is so much wisdom. There is just so much wisdom. Our society, the, our whole vision of morality actually comes from the Bible. And then we've used the Bible and the wisdom of it to build a very successful society. And now we're going to strip it of, of the Bible, of, of Jesus' sacrifice. We're going to try to get all of the good 
that Christianity offers and, and take Jesus out of it. And, and, and we're, we're struggling to make that make sense because it doesn't make sense. It's completely illogical. And if we came from monkeys, there's no reason to treat people like they have rights, but the only reason they have rights is because it's based on John Locke's, well, Jeff, Thomas Jefferson based it on John Locke's theory of um, why we have rights, and that comes from Paul's uh, work of um, we all have rights. <laughs> it all came, it came from the Bible. Um, nobody cared about the underdog before Jesus came around. Nobody was, was interested in uh, helping the poor or the impoverished or the one that wasn't represented. And now we're using Jesus' morality uh, and, uh, and undermining the other aspects of what he says. So the point of the matter is fall in love with the Bible, the whole thing. Get it. Understand it. Uh, there's so much depth and goodness to it. Don't be overwhelmed. You don't, you don't have to be a scholar tomorrow. All you need is to start. Just get one verse a day. Just start. Start to fall in love with the Bible. Um, Psalms is wonderful. Proverbs is wonderful. Those are great places to start. Um, yeah, there's so, just so many good things. There's so much good. Um, I want to just invite you to not have Christian podcasts be your church. That's not it. You've got to be around believers. You've got to be friends with believers. You've got to talk about the things that are going on in your heart with other believers. Um, so I want to invite you to know that there is a war going on. You can't stick your head in the ground and pretend like there's not. There's a war for families, a war for your kids, this next generation, for them to be able to suffer the end times whenever that is. All of us need to be really well practiced at suffering. We all do. And every time you have a little annoyance at your spouse, you have an opportunity to grow in your capacity to suffer and produce self-control. And your kids are watching that. And they are learning to do it too. And it's coming either from the Bible, which is a very logical, mapped out way. But even if you protect your kids from all the world's influences, eventually they're going to grow up and a reason for their own. And they're either going to decide that your example made, uh, made Christianity interesting enough to pursue it, or they're going to be really upset with Christianity because your example was very hypocritical. Don't, don't let your marriage end. Don't let it be unhappy for years. Let your marriage be the one thing that your kids say, well, no matter what, I want what my parents had there. They really knew how to love. Like that's what you want them to. It's worth it to do marriage God's way. It's worth it because the Bible is clear on things that are actually important to be clear on. It's not, it, it's not doing, it's, it, there's just so much wisdom in the Bible. But if you don't know it, you can't tell that there's wisdom. You can't tell that our society is based on the Bible, but they've ripped out. They've tried to rip out Jesus and the need for a sacrifice, the need for atonement. Try to, oh, no, you're fine. You're good. You're a good person. You're not bad. All this. And it's like, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> wait a second. We have to have atonement. We, we can't get rid of our shame and our guilt without Jesus. We have to be ones that worship. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, we want to be ready. We want to be ready when the bridegroom comes. We want to have lamps that are filled with oil so we can go right into the feast, right into your joy. Lord, let us not be, be thinking about the things of man and not the things of God like you rebuked Peter for. You knew you were having to suffer for you, the Lord's, the Father's will to be done. It was the will of the Father. 
Jesus, we thank you for that example. God in flesh, living it out. Lord, let us not walk only towards comfort and good and favor, quote unquote. We don't know if that's your will. We want to do your will. That's what we want to do. Lord, draw us to yourself. Draw this man, draw this woman to yourself to die to themselves in their marriage day in and day out so that ultimately they are a good example of you, Jesus, to their own kids, that they would attract their kids towards you, Jesus, by the way they live, by the way they loved their spouse, the way they served their spouse, whether their spouse did the right thing or not, or not. Lord, I pray that we would be awake to recognize there is a war and we have a role to play. We have a role to play. It's not okay to pretend it's not happening or just to be thinking about our own, our own tiny little thing. Lord, there's something big and we need to play our role. I pray that you would shake the person I'm speaking to awake to their role, to their role in this war. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If we can help you, uh, with the vehicle called marriage that you take on your way to do God's will. That's not the end and of itself. It is not. But it certainly can help or harm your work for the kingdom. I invite you to go to delightyourmarriage.com slash cc. It might take focus and work for a season. But then your marriage is fixed and you go on with what God wants you to be about delightyourmarriage.com slash cc. God bless you. You're in a war. Wake up. Wake up. Thank you so much for listening. If this has blessed you, I encourage you to take a moment and send it to a friend. Also, if you haven't yet rated this podcast five stars, I would love for you to do that. It will actually allow more people to find this material. God bless you, and we'll talk soon.